Do you want it? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our fourth lecture on art in America today. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, let me tell you of some of the symposium's upcoming events. Tomorrow, Kristen Anderson will be our craftsperson in metals at Carver Hall. Alistair McDuff will give a lecture on Eskimo art tomorrow at noon in the Pioneer Room. And tomorrow evening, Palo Soleri will lecture on art in public places and environmental art at 8 p.m. here in the sunroom. Tonight's speaker was born in Yonkers, New York, and received his bachelor's degree from Westland University in Middletown, Connecticut. Later, he received his master's degree and PhD from Columbia University. He then served as a member of the Bennington College Literary Facility and was later managing editor of Harper's Magazine. He returned to teaching as professor of English at Barnard College and served there in that position until his retirement in 1975. Our speaker, Mr. Callenhoven, has written several, several books, including Made in America, The Beer Can by the Highway, and Partners in Banking. Currently, he is Emeritus Professor of English at Barnard College and a trustee on the Vermont Arts Council. And just recently, he served as assistant to the producer for the PBS television series, The Best of Families. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. John Callenhoven. gentlemen, and thank those of you who came any distance for coming out on a night like this. Can those of you in the back hear me clearly? Okay. I put as a title on this thing, The Democratization of Vision, and maybe by the end you'll know why I did. And as a subtitle, I put The Interaction of Technology and Art in photography. When last I was here, speaking at a session of your Institute on National Affairs, I had occasion to quote the French painter Edgar Degas, but ha that having been just short of 15 years ago, on March 15, 1963 to be exact, I'll take the academic prerogative of repeating myself, or rather, as academics do, repeating other people, by repeating what Degas said. He was talking about paintings, and what he said was, a picture is something which requires as much knavery, trickery, and deceit as the perpetration of a crime. The artist does not draw what he sees but what he must make others see. I remind you of that quotation because photography, one aspect of which I will be considering this evening, records precisely what the camera's lens sees, whether or not it is what the photographer wants others to see. I want to insist upon that assertion because a great deal of nonsense has been written and uttered about the deceitfulness of photographic images. Or, if the speaker or writer is less blunt than Degas was, about the right of photographic images to be considered as art. All art is selective. The artist, whether poet, painter, dramatist, novelist, composer, or whatever, selects certain details out of the vast amorphous flux of his total experience and joins or fits together those details in what the regnant philosopher of art calls a perceptible self-identical whole, expressive of human feeling. As Degas also said, even working from nature, you have to compose. Monet said to me, Degas went on, when Yonkin needed a house or a tree, he turned round and took them from behind his back. Well, yes, why not? Photographers are not deceitful. 
They cannot include elements taken from behind the camera's back. It is nonsense to argue, as is frequently done, that the image recorded by lens-focused light on a photographic negative is untrue. In some sense, it can be argued, of course, that photographs often fail to tell the whole truth. But that is equally true of all pictures. Nevertheless, unmodified prints from a photographic negative incontrovertibly tell a truth. The only lying or deceit associated with photography is committed by those who deliberately tamper with the images recorded on their negatives with the intent to produce prints that appear to be straight photographs, but are not. There is, of course, no dishonesty or deceit in manipulating or combining photographic images to produce an interesting design. But the resulting print is not a photograph. And unless the printmaker has deliberately taken pains to be deceptive, no one will mistake it for other than what it is, a design in which photomechanical images are arranged or fitted together or distorted in ways that have more or less interest depending upon its creator's ability as a designer. Most, if not all, of what is called fakery in photography is no such thing. Perhaps you have seen reproductions of photographs made during the 1860s by William Notman in his Montreal studios. Pictures of trappers and hunters posed amid elaborately contrived settings of stone walls, trees, heaps of white fox fur, and salt. These pictures tell no lies. They tell unvarnished truth, namely, that salt and white fox fur under studio light look very much like snow that men, posing by a real tent, set amid small trees brought into a studio, look very much like men posing in an ingeniously contrived studio setting. If, as I have read, Notman publicly claimed to have taken those pictures in the bush, he was a liar, not the photographs. He was also a fool because whoever looked at his transparently honest photographs would believe them, not him. Conversely, there is nothing untruthful about Edward Steichen's greatly admired gum prints of the early 1900s, despite his own assertion in the first issue of Stieglitz's camera work that he was indeed a faker who took liberties, as all artists do, with objective reality. No one looking at his famous picture of Rodin among his sculptures would for a moment consider that that print was evidence that at some instant in the past, Rodin, in fact, sat thus in this pattern of light and shadow, juxtaposed in exactly this way with his sculptures of the thinker and of Victor Hugo. Quite evidently, the picture is not a photograph but a design expressive of Steichen's perception of Rodin as an artist. I must admit that these notions of mine about the truth of photographic images don't please many people who know a great deal more about photography than I do. My friend Janet Malcolm, who writes perceptively about photography and other things for The New Yorker, recently challenged those assertions I've just made by asking, does the photograph showing a tree growing out of someone's head really tell the truth? I see what she is calling attention to, just as you do. But my answer was, about that tree growing out of someone's head, the photographic image tells a very solid truth, that appearances are often deceptive or misleading. And I went beyond that to say, no painting 
or other man-made picture could tell that truth so convincingly. Photographic images untampered with tell us as nearly absolute truths about appearances as we are able to record. What troubles us when we look at a photograph from the vantage point that Janet Malcolm occupied when she asked her challenging question is the result of forgetting that the truths recorded by unmodified photographic images, including snapshots, are truths about light reflecting surfaces only. Surface truths may be amusingly, grotesquely, horribly, or seductively misleading as to the, quote, inner truth, unquote, of things, as we suppose that inner truth to be, or they may, as those recorded in many of Walker Evans' photographs, for example, do, powerfully suggest or imply such an inner truth. But the inner truth of things outside ourselves is never actually perceptible. Plato to the contrary notwithstanding. No pictorial art, neither paintings nor doctored photographs, can incontrovertibly record the inner subsurface truth about anything except the artist's own inner vision, his own way of seeing. And it can do that only, I think, by distorting or in some other way tampering with observable surface truth. Hence the selectivity of all the arts. I conjecture that our uncomfortable doubts about photography as art arise from our conscious or unconscious awareness that unmolested photographic images cannot, in fact, lie about external objective reality and that they often force us to see that reality in ways that do not harmonize with our subjective perception. I was led into those thoughts by your institute's request that I speak about art and technology as one aspect of the program concerned with art in America today, a public matter. For photography is surely the most public art we have, if art it is. And the question of whether or not it is art arises because it is in a basic sense a technological development. In a way, it's curious that there should be any debate about technology's relation to art. Our words technics and art derive from Greek and Latin words having exactly the same meaning. <coughs> if you look up technology in the great Oxford Dictionary, you'll find that it means, first of all, a discourse or treatise on art. Technique is defined, first of all, as a manner of artistic execution or performance in relation to formal or practical details. A technician is, quote, one skilled in the technique or mechanical part of an art as music or painting. Conversely, Art means, first of all, skill as a result of knowledge and practice, technical or professional skill, perfection of workmanship or execution. An artist is, by definition, a follower of a pursuit in which skill comes by study or practice, a practical man opposed to a theorist, he may be a follower of a manual art, a mechanic. 
Only in the mid-19th century, about the time that photography was perfected, did the word artist begin to have the special meaning of one who makes his craft a fine art or one who cultivates one of the fine arts which please by perfection of execution. And only then did the word technology come to mean the study of the practical or industrial arts, a definition which seems to reflect the belief that the fine arts were neither practical nor concerned with the diligence or the organized skills that the word industry denotes. From there, it was a comparatively short but treacherous step to think and talk of art as if it consisted only of the non-material qualities possessed by the products of the so-called fine arts, and to think and talk of technology as if it consisted only of knowledge of the methods and materials used in making things not classified as fine arts. Specifically, the machines and the chemical and physical processes used in modern manufacturing plants. And once that shift in meaning had become part of our everyday language, it was, I suppose, inevitable that technology soon came to mean, first of all, the machines and the processes themselves, and then, by extension, the entire system of large-scale production and distribution. Hence the complacency with which otherwise sensible people insist that art and technology are in some way opposed to one another. And hence also the fuzzy-minded assumption that the blame for our society's shortcomings can be laid upon technology rather than upon human laziness and greed that afflict all of us the owners and managers of machines as sorely as they afflict you and me. The cant phrase is that technology is dehumanizing mankind. I'd like to suggest that the opposite is in fact true, that the accelerating development of technology in all its phases is forcing more and more people to assume the responsibilities of being human. In the moments when we fear technology, we fear it, I think, because we fear the responsibilities it confronts us with. Scholars, even young ones, still talk as if our task were one of civilizing the machine. But technology, I am convinced, is ever more insistently forcing us to see that our real task is to civilize ourselves. I shall be looking at photography from that point of view this evening. Back in 1966, John Tcharkovsky, director of the photography department at the Museum of Modern Art, organized an exhibition called The Photographer's Eye and published a book with that title. In both, he explored the thesis that the study of photographic form must consider the medium's fine art tradition and its functional tradition as intimately interdependent aspects of a single history. A thesis suggested to him, he generously asserted, by a long ago book of mine called Made in America, The Arts in Modern Civilization. Turnabout's fair play, so this evening I shall take off from an idea Sharkovsky drops into the introduction to his book. Having sketched the rapid rise and spread of photography during the first 40 years of its history, he makes this point about the difference between painting and photography in the early 1880s. I quote him, painting was difficult, expensive, and precious and it recorded what was known to be important. Photography was easy, cheap, and ubiquitous, and it recorded anything. 
shop windows and sod houses and family pets and steam engines and unimportant people. And once made objective and permanent, immortalized in a picture, these trivial things took on importance. By the end of the century, that is by 1900, for the first time in history, even the poor man knew what his ancestors had looked like. Tchaikovsky in his book perceptively explores the implications of that fact for the development of photography, showing how it affected the training of the photographer's eye. What I shall try to do is to explore its implications for all of us, non-photographers and photographers alike. For all of us live to a degree we scarcely realize in a world of which we are aware primarily because of photography. And the overwhelming majority of the photographs to which we owe our awareness are snapshots, not salon prints made by artist photographers or those who profess to be such. We live quite literally, in a snapshot world. My own encounter with that extraordinary fact occurred when I looked at the snapshots in an album assembled between 1884 or 1885 and 1915 by one of my mother's older sisters, one of the Philadelphia maiden aunts who in the days when I knew them, dutifully but not joylessly, kept house for their widowed mother my Quaker grandmother. Most of the pictures in the album are snapshots in the sense of the term that I'm employing. They are predominantly photographs taken quickly with a minimum of deliberate posing on the part of the people represented and with a minimum of deliberate selectivity on the part of the photographer so far as vantage point and the framing of the image were concerned. The earliest pictures in the album were taken when my mother was eight or ten years old. The latest, when I was six, and my parents were a still young married couple. Looking through them now, trying to decipher the faded blueprints and sepia prints has its melancholy aspect. None of those pictured in the album, except my sister and I, is now alive. Even the houses they lived in then are gone. And yet, in a curious way, those vanished people and places and events are a vivid part of my present world. Thanks to these familiar snapshots, I am, I suddenly realized, a member of the first generation in human history whose awareness of the past comprises a multiplicity of unarguably real, informal images of our parents' childhood as well as the world of our own childhood. I mean by this more than I think John Sharkovsky meant when he said even the poor man knew by 1900 what his ancestors had looked like. It was true, of course, that almost anyone who was of age at the turn of the century could have a daguerreotype or carte de visite photograph or a tintype of his grandfather or even his great-grandfather. But these were not snapshots. They were formally posed images, often taken amid the luxurious and elegant settings provided by the photographer's studio, painted landscape backgrounds, Grecian columns, balustrades, draperies, tasseled sofas, carved oak chairs. They were the poor man's substitute for a portrait by John Singer Sargent or Carolus Duran. Nothing like an album of snapshots was possible before the 1880s. Beginning then, however, people with cameras ran rampant, as a professional photographer at the time bitterly complained. They haphazardly photographed objects of all sorts, sizes, and shapes, he lamented. Quote, 
without ever pausing to ask themselves, is this or that artistic? The results, gathered into family albums, grant us a visual acquaintance with the past unlike that available to anyone, rich or poor, in previous generations. Many of us have inherited such albums, for even in our mobile throwaway society, people keep such intimate memorabilia, if only because of some vague feeling that it's indecent to do otherwise. The one I own is, I suppose, much like hundreds of others of the same period. And I discuss it and a few of the pictures it contains, not because it is uniquely interesting, but because it is representative. It just happens to be the one to which I owe my recent awareness of what snapshot vision has done to our conception of the past and our conception of present reality. The album's pages are large. Now if we could have the light down and I'll start showing you a few slides, please. The first one on the left, please. Does this light cloud the image? Does that help? Not much? Let me put it out. Okay. Excuse me. <coughs> a typical page in the later part of the album contains at the top a group of vacation snap snapshots taken at Rockport, Massachusetts in the summer of 1910, and at the bottom, a similar group taken at the same resort the following summer. At the center is a slightly tilted picture of the shingle cottage, half of whose ground floor was open porch, with the dormered second floor projecting over it. There are several snapshots of the rocky coast, one with a ready-to-launch Coast Guard lifeboat dominating the entire right half of a picture in which the boat was obviously intended to be only a minor focus of interest. And there are snapshots of posed groups of adults and children arranged in tiers on the porch steps. But not all of the snapshots of people are self-consciously posed. Look at these two, for example, and uh, give me the next one on the left, please, and the next one on the right. Both of them side by side. Slide this one over more, right. Am I in the way of it for some reason? Is that one all the way on the screen? I can't see. Okay. Sorry, I have to have the light again. On the left screen is a snapshot of my grandmother and her parasol sitting near one of my aunts on the sun-warmed rocks across the water from the Straits of Inn. On the right screen, a snapshot taken by one of my aunts from the porch of grandmother's cottage during the arrival of a visitor who's come by automobile. In neither picture, did the human subjects deliberately assume poses they thought were pictorially suitable? In this sense, both pictures qualify as snapshots, even though in the left picture, the photographer's selection of the pictorial elements may have been quite deliberate. In the other picture on the right, however, many of the pictorial elements in the design are obviously accidental as, for instance, the off-balance posture of the smiling woman in dark traveling clothes approaching the camera at the right, the particular way her arms are disposed, and the way the folds of her long skirt curve toward the ground, combine to create an image of lively motion, contrasting with the casual repose of the three white-clad female figures at the left and the straight, dark, unrounded form of the man standing at the center. And surely my aunt, intent on snapping that picture before the visitor came too near the camera, cannot have deliberately composed the picture so that the two telephone poles at the center and the one up the hill near the Straitsmith Inn 
serve as markers for the three groupings of human figures, while the fourth pole at the far left provides a visual accent against the water and the sky to balance the heavier form of the inn against the sky at the right, topping the rise of ground. Nor could she have realized that the lines of the post and rail fence would converge as they do to the smooth rectangular plane of the automobile's roof. In the earliest pages of the album, few of the photographs have the accidental design qualities that these genuine snapshots possess. The young ladies who took them in the late 1880s and the early 1900s saw the world about them with eyes accustomed to seeing what pictures made by well-known painters and illustrators had taught them to see. They had been conventionally educated according to middle-class Philadelphia standards. They took music lessons. They did embroidery and cross-stitching and mending. They carved things out of wood. They drew and painted pictures with varying degrees of skill. In such circumstances, it was inevitable that when my eldest aunt got her first camera in the mid-80s, when she was about 16, she selected her subjects with a painter's rather than a photographer's eye. Many of her early photographs are interior shots, time exposures, taken with the camera on a tripod, by gaslight or by window light reflected from mirrors or white sheets hung behind the camera. The next one on the left, please. Some are quite lovely, but like that one, could not have been composed or lighted by someone who had never seen paintings or engraved reproductions of paintings by Eastman Johnson, John Singer Sargent, or my aunt's distinguished fellow townsman, Thomas Aiken. escorting a young lady through the fields on a summer day in the 90s, the young lady not needing a hat since she walks in the shade of a parasol he's holding for her, my mother and a young friend on a snowy day in the winter of 88 coasting down traffic-free Spruce Street Hill when the children from neighboring houses trudge in counter-movement back up to the top of the rise, next on the right. My never-seen grandfather, dead 15 years before I was born, in his untidy hunting jacket and rumpled gaiters, standing in the back entry of his house with his gun in one hand, a brace of squirrels hanging from the other, looking down at the spaniel who had dropped in contented weariness at his feet. The next on the left, please. My mother and her sisters making Christmas candies in the dining room with the aid of a gas burner on which the sugar syrup was boiled, supplied with gas by a flexible tube descending from one of the branches of the chandelier that hung from the plaster rosette in the center of the ceiling. Number 19, the next one on the right, please. Slide it. The earliest of those snapshots was taken with a handheld camera using the recently perfected dry plate negatives. When we broke up grandmother's house after the last of her unmarried daughters gave up trying to maintain it, I found on a closet shelf one of the cardboard boxes in which a dozen of these three and a quarter by four and a half inch glass plates had been packaged. The blue label tells us they were Arrow brand, extra rapid dry plates for in or outdoor photography made in St. Louis by the MA Seeds Company. 
One of my aunts had written odds and ends on the side of the box and had kept in it two exposed plates, both damaged but both readable. The next two on the left and I mean the next on the left and the next on the right, please. Those, those are the glass plates as I photographed them stuck up against the window. One showed a skating party in the flooded black yard. The other shows my mother as an 18-year-old perched on the porch railing of a seaside cottage, sewing while her cousin reads to her. Now the next pair, please, left and right. I had prints made from them. The plates are marred by fingerprints and spots where the gelatin coating was nicked from the glass and the skating scene was badly light struck. There are no prints from either of those blemished negatives in my aunt's album, but the plates themselves were carefully kept, no doubt because, as Sharkovsky says, even such trivial images, once made objective and permanent, seem too important to destroy. Both the projectors off, please, so that we have a black screen and we can have the house lights up. Those gelatin-coated dry plates, commercially available at relatively little cost in the early 1880s, brought about a major change in the nature of photographic images. For one thing, they freed the photographer from the necessity to remain close to his dark room. With the earlier wet plate process, you had to prepare the glass plate in the dark room, illuminated only by a dim red or orange light, by coating it with a collodion and soaking it in a silver nitrate solution. Then insert it in a light-proof holder carry it to where your camera had already been set up and focused, insert it, still wet, in the camera, uncap your lens, make your time exposure, recap the lens, take the exposed plate in its resealed holder immediately back to the dark room, and put it through a series of chemical baths to bring out and fix the image. Only if you had a portable dark room in a tent or a horse-drawn wagon could you move about with any freedom at all. And even then, the time required to select your subject, set up and focus your camera, prepare your chemicals, make your plate ready, precluded the possibility of anything like spontaneous picture taking. The dry plates, available in the 1880s, however, were ready whenever you wanted them, and the new compact hand cameras with fast-acting mechanical shutters and simple viewfinders were quite light and easy to carry. So you were relatively free to wander about taking pictures wherever and whenever you wanted to. Furthermore, the new cameras and plates were amazingly cheap. The average amateur's equipment in the late 80s cost less than $20, including camera, tripod, six double plate holders, and a box of a dozen dry plates. Since the plates were, as the arrow bland label says, extremely sensitive, you could get a clear picture with an expo exposure of 1 25th of a second or even less in normal daylight and even at night you could do so with the aid of inexpensive magnesium flares. So you didn't have to carry your tripod with you, fix your camera to it, fiddle with its adjustable legs to level your camera every time you took a picture. The whole business of picture taking, thanks to the dry plate, suddenly became both easy and unobtrusive. A picture-taking expedition had been reduced from something like an African safari to the equivalent of a mere stroll with a picnic basket. You could photograph anything or anybody with a minimum of fuss, 
and even more importantly, without enlisting the cooperation of your subjects. And because you could do so, you did do so. The era of snapshots had arrived. When George Eastman came along at the end of the 1880s with his extraordinarily constant decodac and his celluloid roll film, he vastly increased the number of snapshots you could take on a single loading of the camera, and by cheapening and simplifying the process, vastly increased the number of people who could indulge in the sport. But hundreds of thousands of snapshots had been taken on dry plates before Kodak, you press the button, we do the rest, became one of the best known advertising slogans in history. The word snapshot, as I pointed out several years ago in an article in Aperture, was originally a hunting term. The earliest recorded use of the word is in the diary of an English sportsman with the apposite name of Hawker, who in 1880 noted that almost every bird he got was by snapshot, meaning a hurried shot taken without deliberate aim. As early as 1860, Sir John Herschel, one of the pioneers of photography and the man who invented its name, by the way, speculated about the possibility at some future time of being able to take photographs in a tenth of a second as it were by a snapshot. But that was a figure of speech, depending for its effect upon the reader's familiarity with Hunter's lingo. Even in the 1880s, by which time it appears frequently in articles about the new instantaneous photography, its hunting origins were still remembered and acknowledged by putting the term in quotes. But by 1890, the takeover was complete, and Anthony's photographic bulletin and other magazines could and did publish what it labeled snapshots taken with a hand camera, no quote, no apologies, whatever. The term had been appropriated to photography because it was appropriate. Ever since the dry plates became available, people have been fascinated with the idea of shooting pictures surreptitiously. They went about hunting for unposed images to record, taking pictures of people before they had time to freeze into the formal expressions and stances we instinctively adopt when we ready ourselves for posterity, even taking pictures of people without their knowledge. Indeed, the early hand cameras were generally referred to as detective cameras. And George Eastman's advertisements of his first Kodak claimed only that it was the smallest, lightest, and simplest of all detective cameras, not something altogether new. Even that claim was only partly justified. The Kodak was considerably larger and heavier than the concealed vest camera advertised in the late 1880s, which could be hung around your neck under your vest or coat with its button-shaped lens protruding through a convenient buttonhole. It came in two sizes, but even the larger $15 size was smaller than a Kodak and it had been on the market for two years before the Kodak appeared. An article in Harper's in January 1889 said that as many as 300 of these buttonhole cameras were carried in Russia by the police, <laughs> and that in Germany they were very popular, especially with artists. A clientele that tells us, I suppose, as much about late 19th century German art as it does about the Tsar's police. In any event, the insistence in advertisements on the concealed, invisible aspect of such cameras and upon their being, quote, always ready and in focus, witnesses the then current interest in unpremeditated shots at unwitting subjects. And if one looks at any group of snapshots made at the time and compares them with the paintings and engravings and other pictorial material then available, one can easily see why. For without intending to do so, without realizing what they were doing, 
the amateur takers of snapshots were revolutionizing mankind's way of seeing. We do not yet realize, I think, how fundamentally the snapshot altered the way people saw one another and the world around them. I am, of course, aware that much has been written about the effects of photography on many aspects of our culture. William M. Ivins, Jr., for some years the curator of prints at the Metropolitan Museum, said some of the wisest and the crispest and the most profound things that have ever been said on this topic 20 years ago in that fascinating book of his, too scrupulously entitled Prints and Visual Communication, a title that gives no hint of its far-reaching implications and its illuminating insights into the way changes in the technology of picture making and of picture reproduction have affected not only the visual arts, but science and technology as well. But we've paid very little heed to the effects that snapshots have had upon all of us, photographers and non-photographers, 